Rashford, what are you doing? Put your helmet back on. Relax, it's fine. How is it fine? We're on the moon. The moon just needed a little atmosphere. So I dimmed the lights, started playing smooth jazz, added some themed decor, a couple of orchids. It was a breeze, eventually. You, you terraformed the moon? Just this little bit. Now are you going to join me for lunch or what? I just built a small cafe on the other side of that crater wall. So that's where you were when you were supposed to be helping me with the chemistry experiments. It takes chemistry to make a good cup of coffee. I guess I could go for a sandwich? Hey, do we have any kimchi? You turned the moon into a chill spot. NASA's gonna love our expense report. Houston, we have a latte. <laughs> <laughs> The Cosmic Companion Season 8 premiere, featuring James G. Maynard. This week, Moonstruck, Tales of Earth's Lunar Love Affair, talking with Rebecca Boyle, author of Our Moon. More than four and a half billion years in the past, Earth 1.0, the first version of our home world, was on a collision course with Thea, a celestial body as big as Mars. It would be a date with destiny. Hi there, I'm Destiny. This cosmic dance resulted in a spectacular crash ripping both worlds apart. The aftermath of molten mess, which quickly cooled down, giving birth to two celestial bodies we now call home. Earth and our loyal sidekick, the moon. But this story wouldn't be done yet. Oh, no, 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 no. That would make for too short of an episode. Gravity from our new planetary dance partner reached down into the ocean depths, pulling up nutrients and enriching the waters. It was like the moon was setting the table for the grand banquet of life. But wait, there's more! The moon's pull also kept Earth's wobbling check, making our planet's dance and space more graceful. This moderated climatic change is providing a smoother ride for our life around the globe. Now, since that ancient age, tidal forces have also lifted oceans and land alike twice a day. Many cycles of life are now dependent upon the moon. Nighttime is when the real party starts. The moon is my spotlight. The night is my stage and the world's trash is my treasure. Ever seen a raccoon rave in the daylight? Didn't think so. Sandhoppers. Did, did you mention sandhoppers? Good call. Sandhoppers, adorable little crustaceans found on sandy beaches around the United Kingdom, have unique, unique way of living thanks to our planetary companion. Um, now, imagine being a tiny little critter living at the water's edge. Stray too far up the land and you're either a dried up beach bum or the world's tiniest shrimp cocktail. Look out, Charlie Duck! Duck? Do you mean the bird or the act of... Uh. Oh, gross. Head too close to the water and you washed out to sea. But fear not, our sandhopper friends have a solution. A pair of natural compasses. One of them is in the brain sunbathing by day and the other in their antennae moon gazing at night. Now, birds like Barrow's petrels also have a lunar love affair. They always show up for their breeding dates under the light of a full moon. It's just more romantic that way. Dear God! Sea turtles! The laid-back parents of the animal kingdom I time their egg laying so that their hatchlings pop out when the tides are best for survival. Now, it's basically their one act of parental care, so cut them some slack. And let's not forget the dung beetles rolling their precious poop by the light of the moon, all to avoid losing their treasure or becoming someone's dinner. Delicious. Next up, we're going to chat with Rebecca Boyle, author of Our Moon. Join us for an interstellar joyride through the cosmos with the Cosmic Companion. Every week, our intrepid host, James G. Maynard, dives headfirst into the wildest corners of science, comedy, pop culture, and history. 
the Cosmic Companion takes you on a roller coaster of knowledge with entertaining dives into fascinating subjects. James is like your science-obsessed buddy who's always ready with a fun fact at a party. Oh, and what's yeah. a cosmic journey without some quality company? James rubs shoulders, figuratively of course, with the creme de la creme of the scientific world. We're talking brainiacs who decipher the laws of the universe, authors who craft stories that warp space and time, and developers who are building the future. Our cosmic guest list? Oh, it's star-studded. We've had the likes of Neil deGrasse Tyson, dinosaur expert Steve Brusati from Jurassic World, the legendary ocean explorer Sylvia Earle, a myriad of astronauts, actors, and a constellation of other awe-inspiring guests. But wait, there's more. The Cosmic Companion isn't just any show, we've got AI on our side. Hello. I am AI. Hmm. Did you know that is a palindrome? We're talking mind-bending visuals, snazzy animations, original music, and soundscapes that'll make your eardrums do the moonwalk. Are you ready to embark on this epic journey? Head over to thecosmiccompanion.net and get ready to laugh, learn, and explore the mysteries of the universe. This week on the Cosmic Companion, we are delighted to be joined by Rebecca Boyle. She is a science journalist and, an, uh, and the author of Our Moon, How Earth's Celestial Companion Transformed the Planet, Guided Evolution, and Made Us Who We Are. Welcome to the show, Rebecca. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, so it's usually no better place to start than the beginnings of things. So first of all, what you call yourself a lifelong lunar enthusiast? What what got you into science and studying the moon? I think I've always just loved the moon ever since I was a kid. I think a lot of kids sort of have an affinity for it. It's in so many bedtime stories. Yeah, yeah I never lost that connection to it. I think it's always just been like a companion to me. I remember being a kid and being on the floor of my elementary school library, listening to the Apollo tapes and just kind of being blown away. Like they were, they were on that other world. This is crazy to me. And I wanted to be an astronaut. And then I kind of grew up and realized that I didn't want to be an astronaut. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> like it sounds fun in theory, but uh, I did. I went to space it? camp. Yeah. It's yeah. I went to space <laughs> camp as a kid and was like, that's that's about as many uh, G's as I think I wanted to experience in real life. So I um, I decided to study history instead and uh, literature. So. I guess I decided to write about my lifelong love and instead of trying to go and walk on it. Right, right. And uh, I think I reached my limit with cheese on those tilt a whirls and the carnival. And yeah, <laughs> that was enough. <laughs> that was enough training for me, I think. Uh, and um, so, and the moon, we've gone, we've had some ideas of early planetary impact long ago to maybe kick off the light of the moon, but give us a little bit of an idea of how the moon came to be. So I love the idea that we are not totally sure how this all went down. Mm. So we know that something really bad had to have happened. We know that something probably the size of Mars today thwacked into early Earth early in its history, and both of these planets were totally obliterated. So there wouldn't be a scar of this. There wouldn't be like a crater. It's more like the Earth was pulverized and so was the impactor and somehow they both both planets were totally mixed and recombined into the earth and the moon we have now we don't actually know exactly how that happened because it's such a strange and violent phenomenon that we've never seen anywhere else we're pretty unique in the solar system and as far as we know the entire rest of the galaxy and maybe beyond so the particulars of this story are still kind of being ironed out but we know that there had to have been some kind of giant impact that cleaved um, Earth and the impactor Theia apart and gave us these two very similar worlds that orbit each other, to each other today. And it's a good thing it, it does. I, I happen to really enjoy the moon. <laughs> yeah, we're lucky to have it. I mean, it, it's sort of, this was the most 
monumental day in the history of Earth. It destroyed Earth 1.0 and led to what I consider Earth 2.0, um, which is this planet we have now that has our moon. And I don't think it would be this way without the moon. I don't think Earth would be the planet that it is now if it didn't have a part of itself orbiting itself. And the moon really is a part of Earth. We learned this from Apollo. Once the rocks came back to Earth, we realized that they were very similar to Earth rocks. And that doesn't make a lot of sense because if the moon formed from the remains of this impactor, it should look different from Earth because just the way that planets are made, which is another story we don't totally understand, actually, how planets actually form around the sun. They form in different areas. They form in different locations. And that says something about what can be within them like the the way that they combine around the sun the way that they cool and coalesce leaves this fingerprint of their formation so yeah. you can look at a rock from mars and know that it's from mars it's very different from an earth rock and that's not the case for the moon it looks like the moon rocks are very very similar to earth rocks almost identical chemically which means that the moon really is a part of our planet and it was shorn apart at some point um, it's not just the remains of whatever hit the earth. It is really the same as earth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. And thought that uh, the moon even played a role in the uh, development of life on earth, didn't it? Yeah, I was surprised to the extent of which this is true, actually. I, I felt like it would have had some kind of impact, but... I learned this because I heard about some interesting coral fossils. So corals have these growth rings that are kind of like tree rings where mm -hmm. you can look at them and see how old they were, or their environment as they lived. And there was a study on coral fossils from 400 million years ago that showed that the day was about 20 hours long because the moon was closer. So the day is lengthening or Earth's day is getting longer as the moon is moving away from us. So when it was a long time ago, the moon was closer, the day was shorter. It took less time for Earth to spin. And I thought, well, if it was closer, then probably it had a higher, you know, greater pull on Earth. The tide was stronger. Right. And it was. And it turns out that this higher tide signal coincided with the evolution of land-based life. So when the moon was nearer to Earth 320 million years ago, so a little bit after these coral fossils, a little bit being relative, so, you know, 80 million years or so. Um, this is when fish were starting to emerge from the water and move onto land during the Devonian period. And this is when Pangaea was beginning to form. So the supercontinent that gives rise to the dinosaur is the kind of famous, you know, one continent covering the whole planet. This means ocean basins are closing at the time. So the tide was really extreme. So you'd have like, you know, 80 feet between high and low tide, which only is about a few hours. So just imagine the, the rate at which water is going down or rising. It's really rapid. And if you're a fish in shallow water, like you better get out of there. All right. Or you better learn how to breathe the air and move across the land instead of just through the water. And that's what happened. And I think if the moon wasn't here and driving that process of our tides, I don't know, would, would fish have ever learned to walk? I don't know. We, we can't know for sure, but I think the role of the moon has been underappreciated in this story of our evolution. Hmm. And of course the moon has had a huge, huge impact on um, the development of science and literature and mythos and in the early in the early world um can you talk a little bit about about that yeah this was another thing that i felt was sort of surprising once i started researching the book i knew that the moon was kind of responsible for our method of telling time so like the month still comes from the moon it's the moon is an old english word and that's how we still divide time is by lunar cycles so i knew that was important and i knew that was how early humans kind of figured out how to orient ourselves in time and plan for the future you know as far as we know humans are the only species that can say in six moons from now i'm gonna go on vacation or like i'm gonna have a wedding or whatever um and the moon is the reason why we figured that out and the other thing is that the moon 
and the sun are very different in their season. So there are 12 moons in a solar year, 12 months, but there are only about 354 days in those lunar cycles. And there are 365 solar days right now. <laughs> um, that's also changing. But so if you have to combine those two cycles, that's difficult to do. And people throughout Earth, throughout cultures, figured out ways to do this. And I realized writing this book that when people figured that out, that gave them this new form of power over one another. And it allowed them to sort of develop civilization and, and to be able to plan and say, here's when we're going to harvest our crops. Here's when we're going to have a market or some sort of ceremonies, or here's when we're going to have to hunt. All these things that we figured out in society to derive our culture, the moon really played a role in all of those things. And I think it really gave people the tools to command each other and to control each other. Hmm. For better or worse, I suppose. Yeah, for better or worse. <laughs> um, and of course, you know, the moon is the only celestial body other than Earth on which humans have walked. What, what, what do you see as being some of the benefits that we gained as a human society from the Apollo missions? There are a lot of answers like miniaturization of technology, you know, the computers that people used to um, plan the Apollo trajectories. I mean, most of the computers were actually humans, <laughs> work people working, Katherine Johnson being one of the more prominent ones, people working at NASA to develop the trajectories that we needed to use to get there safely. But, you know, then there were early computer cards where you had like literally a room sized thing and people had to put punch cards in them to be able to compute um, orbits. And now, you know, these are like in our watches, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I think Apollo played a huge role in, in the, the development of that kind of technology. But I think it's a lot more fundamental than that. I think our relationship to the earth really changed during Apollo. And I think that's partly because we finally saw the earth from somewhere else and realize that it is this fragile home. It is this tiny speck in a vast and uncaring universe. And it gave us a new appreciation for that and how, how we needed to take care of our planet. And I think it also really changed our relationship to the moon. You know, I my favorite picture from Apollo is not the famous one of like Buzz Aldrin saluting the flag or where he's like standing there and you could see Neil Armstrong reflected in his helmet. It's actually of Aldrin climbing down the ladder because his he's sort of above you. So Neil Armstrong took this photo looking up at Buzz walking down the lunar lander ladder. And it blows my mind because to me, it's like the human mind is now occupying the moon, looking out receiving another person coming onto the moon for the first time ever in human history in millennia, millions of years of humans looking up at the moon and pondering it. Now we're looking out from it. And that's such a transformative thing. And I think sometimes we take that for granted too, that the moon is a place that we have inhabited. Hmm. And of course we have Artemis coming up. Hopefully in the next few years, what are, what are your thoughts on the future of Artemis and human habitation on the moon? I think it's exciting. I mean, I think it's probably inevitable and, you know, it's sort of taken longer than people imagined it might to go back, but I think it's going to happen. I think it's going to happen probably in the next couple of years. You know, we just had a delay this past week. NASA pushed back the first Artemis crewed. Uh, well, both crewed missions, the first crewed mission around the moon since Apollo and the first landing since Apollo 17 is now going to happen no earlier than September of 2026, which, again, might be like optimistic, I think it's fair to say. Yeah. But I do think it'll happen. And I think people will be up there and coming and going. And um, I hope that we consider it the way that we consider Antarctica, where you know, we're not, no one wants to live there permanently. <laughs> you can, but it's pretty austere. It's pretty difficult. It's not the greatest place to be. Um, you need to be really well trained and really well equipped and prepared to be able to do that. And I think that's how we're going to be able to access the moon is just knowing that it's not going to be simple. It's not going to be easy. It's possible, but it's going to be very hard. Hmm. That's fabulous. So of course, um, Biggest question of all to finish up with here. 
is how did this whole story about the moon being made of blue cheese start? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's fun to think about some of the, the myths that people have had about the moon through time. You know, I mean, my favorite is is still the idea of seas. If you look at, hmm. I mean, behind you, you have this beautiful picture of the moon right, right. and you see the Maria, you know, these dark blotches. And up until really recently, actually, people thought they were literally oceans. And I mean, why wouldn't they? Earth has oceans right. and it, the moon Makes looks kind of like Earth, it looks like continents and maybe some bodies of water. And so that's why we call them Maria, because that's the Latin name for seas. So, yeah, I think there's there's a lot of uh, different ideas people have had over time about what the moon actually is. Hmm. And I think one of my favorites I heard was um, that the moon is actually a space station for highly <laughs> intelligent extraterrestrials that are watching Earth, but not, a, not probably not a lot of truth to that, is there? Well, the earliest version of that actually goes back to Kepler um, himself, the the scientist from the 1600s. Right, 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 right. His original lunar lunar fiction called Somnium is I detail this in the book that it's sort of the first science fiction story, and he does imagine this like race of beings living on the moon and looking up at Earth and pondering it the way that we look at the moon and Earth's phases change, and it's this really involved kind of bizarre fever dream. <laughs> But yeah, he's he's the first one to imagine that. That's fabulous. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Rebecca. It was great talking with you. Thanks for having me. This was fun. Yeah. And uh, that was Rebecca Boyle. Check out her new book, Our Moon, just out from Random House. Now, have you ever noticed how the moon just loves to play peekaboo in the sky? Peekaboo! It's no wonder we've been using its phases to keep track of time since mm, forever. Heck, we even named a day of the week after it Moon Day. Now, the moon has been a muse for artists, writers, and musicians throughout history. Take the uh, Neighbor Sky Disc, for instance. And now here it is. Now the ain't this ancient LP sized bronze disc from 3600 years ago, decked out with gold celestial bodies. There's the Pleiades. And an image of our moon is the world's oldest star chart. Fast forward to the first century BCE and you've got the Antikythera mechanism, the world's first analog computer. Now this ancient gadget could predict the positions of the moon and sun in the sky, eclipses, and even the schedule for Olympic Games. The Antikythera was an awesome ancient app 20 centuries before smartphones. Talk about ahead of your time. In 1609, Galileo took his brand new telescope out for a spin, sketching the moon's mountains and craters. Though he and everyone else for a couple hundred years thought they were produced by volcanoes, they were wrong. They're the result of asteroid impacts. This revelation of a rough, torn, changing lunar surface shook up the idea of perfect, eternal celestial bodies. Fast forward to 1969 and the world watched in awe as Apollo 11 landed on the moon, uniting humanity together for one short moment, watching fellow humans traipse across the next great wonderland. The next pioneers to leave their footprints on the moon might be part of NASA's Artemis program, or they may be from China's CNSA. Regardless of their home country, this is a monumental step as we as a species venture beyond our planetary cradle, taking our first steps towards the stars. Our moon might even be considered the eighth continent of Earth, the Geocorona, Earth's outermost layer of atmosphere rich in hydrogen, encompasses the moon. With vast stores of water ice in its southern craters, the moon will almost certainly be our launching pad on the human journey toward a future free from scarcity and poverty. So here's to our moon, the celestial body that keeps on giving. Next week on the Cosmic Companion, we're talking Jaws, Claws, Life and Death with Jennifer Zamansky, author of Deadliest Animals on the Planet. 
Now, don't forget to join us on the 10th of February. And yes, we're on Substack. Just head on over to thecosmiccompanion.com. Clear skies.